with that, I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker for today, uh, Emily Swackhammer, who is a horticultural, a horticulture educator at the great University of Penn State. She's with Extension, and we're so glad to have you here with us, Emily. And I've been looking forward to this ever since you committed to making these presentations, but I think you have a lot to tell us about this invasive pest and also some ways we can help uh, address the issue here in Tennessee and beyond. But thank you, Emily, for being here. Well, it is my pleasure. Um, and yeah, I, I hope I can help. So let me get set up here. Okay. There we go. How's that? Looks good. We good? Okay. So um, thank you for inviting me. So for this hour, we're going to talk about the spotted lanternfly, which is an invasive insect that was um, brought to Pennsylvania and discovered in 2014. And the title of my presentation includes What Have We Learned? So when it came to Pennsylvania, um, it it was discovered four miles away from our my family's farm. And immediately people were talking about it. We have a stand where people come for produce and you know that's where you find out all the news in the community. People were talking about this insect that uh, they had found and there were agency trucks in the area. So the USDA was there, our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture was there. And then they announced that they had discovered this insect um, in November of 2014. So I have been through it with this one and um, hopefully some of the things I'll share with you today will help you as you, you know, this new infestation in Tennessee unfolds. <laughs> so now my slides won't advance. Let me, there we go, okay. I'm been having network problems today for some strange reason. So this um, cartoon appeared in our local papers, um, you know, after the spotted lantern fly was here for a while. And I think this cartoonist, this artist really captures the frenzy that happened in Pennsylvania. And being in extension, it was, you know, my job to teach people and deliver research-based information to help them learn, you know, to better react to it. But we had, you know, we had people that were just totally freaked out. Um, the artist draws the insect here with these big chomping looking teeth, which is not at all what kind of mouth parts they have. I'll show you their piercing sucking mouth parts in a minute. People knew it was related to this tree of heaven, an invasive tree species that they love to feed on. Um, you know, you can just see like the frenzy that was happening here. Um, they show them flying in formation up here in the adult stage. People were using sticky bands on trees to trap them, and we'll talk a little bit about trapping today. Um, you probably heard the message, stomp them, squish them. People using pesticides, and, and sometimes appropriately and not always, sometimes inappropriate pesticide use. We're teaching children, you know, can't swat them dead <laughs> to, to kill insects and and, you know, people would take issue with that, that, um, you know, it's better to teach children some insects are good and some insects are not good and just not, you know, kill every insect kind of message. So I think this um, cartoon artist really captured what happened in Pennsylvania. Things have really settled down, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if you have a little bit of a frenzy going on um, in Tennessee with this announcement. So to combat that kind of public reaction, we have our extension service and um, we immediately went to work trying to gather research-based information, you know, put research in place and then deliver it in a way that you could teach the public. Um, the current way that we're doing this is with our spotted lanternfly management guide. You can find this online. It's very easy. If you just Google the title, it should come up and then you can download a PDF that is printable. And this is our attempt at trying to put all of these different um, facets of the story into one place so you can find it. All right. So spotted lanternfly feeds with a piercing sucking mouth part. And the box here highlights that around um, 
around that piercing sucking mouth part. It is a native insect to Asia and it was brought here unintentionally, likely on commerce. And the way that it's moving around mostly to, you know, uh, further distances is through human transport. So avoiding that is critical in keeping it from moving any further. And we'll talk about that too later on. So it feeds on plant sap through a piercing sucking mouth part. It's a passive feeder. It doesn't really suck sap out. It puts the mouth part in and then the vigor of the tree pushes the sap into the mouth parts. And trees that are very vigorous and full of sap push a lot of sap into their mouth parts and they know that and they like those trees. So they'll um, choose specific trees that are like their favorites and they tend to come back to those trees year after year and they can build to really high populations on those favorite trees. When it pulls or when it gets the honey, the sap into its body, it is kind of inefficient in its digestion and it um, pulls a lot into its body, but it excretes a lot that still has sugars in it. And we call that substance honeydew. So the honeydew will be dripping out of the trees that have these infestations. And I, um, I'll show you some videos, you know, what that looks like too. And um, then the honeydew has a lot of sugar content and that allows molds to grow on it. So you get sooty mold, which is a black uh, moldy uh, accumulation underneath these feeding spotted lanternflies. So all of this is really, um, you know, bad for the trees that it's pulling, that it's getting the sap from, but also um, icky in the landscape. So it's a nuisance. So there's a, two good sources for information about where spotted lanternfly currently is. And um, the New York State IPM program has been updating their map. And that's what I'm showing here with um, the blue counties where it has been identified that there's an established population. So you can see, you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, surrounding states, but then we have some newer infestations in the Chicago area. Here's this Nashville area. And um, this was, um, this version was from November 9th, but I think there's a newer version online as well. So you have to keep checking back. The USDA also has a map with detections on it. So there's there's really two good sources for this information. So, you know, the message right now in Pennsylvania foremost is avoid spreading it. And we have a permit system in Pennsylvania and it's shared by New Jersey and Maryland. So this might be something that Tennessee decides to do. I'm not sure if that's coming or not, but in Pennsylvania, Businesses and organizations that conduct business in the in the quarantine zone is where it is known to exist, the blue counties on the map I showed you. They must have permits to move vehicles, equipment, and goods within and out of the zone. So to get a permit in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, you take um, a permit, you listen to a recorded webinar, and then you take a quiz at um, this website. So it's pretty easy to get a permit, and a lot of people have done that, but the permit is just the first step in this prevention step that we're trying to achieve. So getting a permit tells us that you have some knowledge about it and that you, you know, you're know you going to try to do what you can, but then you also have to keep vehicle logs. So, um, so you're attesting to the fact that you're inspecting what you're moving around, and that's really the most important part that you're being careful and, and actively trying to not spread it. So um, spotted lanternfly can certainly live in Pennsylvania. And there's been a couple studies where they've looked at growing degree days, heat, heat accumulation, um, presence or absence of its favorite host, the tree of heaven, and predicting where it could live. And this is one of these studies so you can see the orange areas is where it's very likely that the spotted lantern fly would be able to live there. And then, you know, it goes out with the yellow and green colors from there. So it has the potential to be um, established in a large part of our country. And we are concerned about all of these areas. We're concerned about new areas. So the grape growing regions um, and, and, you know, especially the Central Valley of California. We really don't want this insect to spread any further. We don't want it to get to California. We want to protect agriculture. 
So in Tennessee, I, I just Googled, you know, report a spotted lanternfly and I found this report a pest. So you do have a system in place that if you think you found a spotted lanternfly, you can, you know, easily find a way to report it to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. We have a similar reporting system in Pennsylvania. So some, something about the biology of the insect. Spotted lanternfly loves Alanthus altissima, which is the common name tree of heaven, and I've abbreviated it as TOH. This is a young tree of heaven, and this is a sentinel plant that if you have them in your community, watch them. They're the first place you'll probably find spotted lanternfly. And then they, if there's a lot of tree of heaven, it's an excellent food source for the insect and they can build to really high numbers on this tree. So knowing how to identify tree of heaven is really important and you can find good information, you know, again, online and stuff, but very briefly, it has pinnately compound leaves. There's a whole leaf shown there at the bottom. That's one leaf with many leaflets and they have a smooth leaf margin. So along the edges here, this part is smooth. Um, our black walnut and staghorn sumac, which is are the two that are often confused with this tree, they have a fine serration on the edges of the leaf margin. Tree of Heaven also has one to two lobes at the base of the leaflet. So look for those, that's another identification characteristic. One more way to know if you have a Tree of Heaven is to crush the leaves or break the stems and smell them. And they have a very rank odor. People describe it as rotten peanut butter. So smell the, the tree and that will help you identify it and distinguish it from others that are often confused. Well, why are we so concerned about it? Well, grapes are really the primary concern for agriculture. This is a picture of a vineyard that I was in in October of 2019. You can see on the, the hillside in the back, these are uh, all grape vines and they're still in leaf. They're starting to show fall color. But this block, this was a cultivar called Gewürztraminer, and it was totally wiped out by heavy infestation of spotted lanternfly for about two years. So we've lost acres of grapes in Pennsylvania. We believe and we have some evidence that there's uh, differences in tolerance of grapevines um, to different levels of spotted lanternfly based on their cultivar, but we're we're just starting to chip away at that to, you know, to help the grape growers know which plants are going to be, which uh, cultivars will be the most susceptible. So in um, in Pennsylvania, we have some, you know, some stories about the different farms. We had a 90% yield loss in a 40 acre planting. We had a 100% death of an eight acre Pinot Noir planting, a 45% yield reduction in 10 acres of Chardonnay grapes. And we've documented increase in insecticides costs and labor at vineyards when spotted lanternfly was present. So there's um, a group of researchers at Penn State that are working on the grape questions. And this is just some results from one of them. They put, um, they built cages around grapevines and they were exclusion cages. So they could put lanternflies in there at different, you know, population levels and then study the effects on the vines. And one thing to note about this study is that, you know, they put a lot of lanternflies in the cages and then they kept them in there for a long time. In vineyard situations, you know, out in the field, the lanternflies sometimes come in and feed for a while and they'll move on um, or they'll be there and then the grower will spray and kill them and it'll take a little while for them more to come in. So this was this constant exposure. The length of the exposure was longer than in most vineyards, but they were really giving it, you know, the real test here. Um, they found that higher populations of spotted lanternfly had more effects on carbon and nitrogen dynamics. So they reduced photosynthesis and, you know, they measured these, these uh, physiological changes on the vines. And what happens is they take so much of the sap away from the vines and the strength, and then the vines won't make it through the winter. So the, the kill happens usually over the winter for the most part. Um, this all suggests a treatment threshold of greater than four spotted lanternflies per shoot or 60 per vine for vines with 15 shoots. 
this is the kind of information the researchers trying to get to for our producers so they can have these action thresh thresholds and they can go out and monitor and determine if um, uh, treatment practice is warranted. And then the presence or absence of other stressors would certainly factor in. Um, so if you have, you know, other stressors going on that are weakening the vines and you have an exceptionally cold winter, you might have more winter kill than if it had just been spotted lanternfly on its own. So they certainly affect grapes, but they also can affect trees. So this is a picture from July 27th of 2022, where we have spotted lanternfly fourth in star nymphs feeding on black walnut. And they have just taken so much sap out of these the, you know, the, the twigs that the leaves are senescing and they will fall off and you'll get dieback on black walnut. So that certainly has a physiological effect on the trees and black walnut in Pennsylvania, they're everywhere. So this is another really good food source for them. Uh, Dr. Kelly Hoover at Penn State and some of her um, lab have been doing studies on hardwood trees. And this is just results from one of them. There's some other um, information that's out as well. But in this particular study, they looked at silver maple and red maple, and they documented suppression of a gas exchange in photosynthesis. So it's reducing photosynthesis on some trees, reduction of nitrogen in leaves, reduction of soluble sugars in leaves and branch wood, and reduced tree diameter growth. So tree diameter growth is important for nursery production. I know you have a lot of nursery production in Tennessee. So, um, you know, if you're producing your crop, you know, a block and you want to have it ready for sale in, in six years and it takes, you know, eight years to produce it, that's a loss of money right there for that producer. So this is concerning and we need more work on the feeding effects on hardwood trees. Um, so it definitely suggests that moderate to heavy feeding on maples may impair growth. So it can affect grapes, it can affect the health of trees, but it's also a nuisance in landscapes. And this picture shows how, you know, what that looks like. This is a tree of heaven. Some people have tree of heaven very prominent in their landscape. Um, you know, they've never really been before other than the fact that they're an invasive tree species. But now, all of a sudden, with this insect around, high of spotted lanternfly can develop. And, you know, feeding on the sap, they're secreting honeydew, and honeydew is falling down to the ground all around it. And, um, and we have sooty mold forming. So this, the other thing that's happening here is there are stinging insects that like the honeydew and they come to it so it can be swarming with things like yellow jackets, which is also a nuisance in the landscape. So I see that my internet connection, I just got a warning that it's unstable. So Katie or Neil, if I, if I freeze, just let me know. I can um, try to stop my video and maybe that will help. <laughs> so speaking of video, I wanna show you a video of uh, one of this, these situations. Where you have the adults feeding, you have um, the honeydew coming out of the tree, you can see it capturing in the sunlight, and then uh, stinging insects swarming all around. And this is in a uh, like a commercial setting, uh, but not something you want in any public landscape. Spotted lanternfly has a really broad host range, and that makes it super different than most insect pests. So it feeds on a wide range of plants. It almost seems like it can feed on just about any plant that it needs to in order to be able to survive. Might not be its favorite food, but it still can survive on, on just so many plants. It does have preferred hosts, and these are the plants to be watching for it if you're monitoring, you know, if you're trying to find it in a location. Certainly tree of heaven, grape, black walnut, the maples. They seem to prefer silver and red over Norway and sugar maple, willows, staghorn sumac, and others. One good piece of information is that it seems to not like conifers so much. So if you are a conifer producer, it may not be as stressful on your trees, but with regulations like we have in Pennsylvania, if they happen to lay eggs on those conifers and you're trying to sell them, then it can turn into like a regulatory problem for you. So you would have to scrape and destroy eggs 
um, before you ship those trees. So to summarize that part, um, to date, spotted lanternfly really has not been observed to kill plants other than grapevines. They have killed tree of heaven as well. And that's what the picture shows. Um, this is a younger grove of tree of heaven that came up in an area that had been logged. And after two years of heavy spotted lanternfly infestations, some of the tree of heaven started to die. Um, we usually find secondary invaders in those trees, things like ambrosia beetle and um, armillaria melia, the shoestring root rot. So, um, you know, weakens them to a point where they can be attractive to those sorts of organisms as well. We have seen a few walnut saplings killed by heavy infestations, but that's not well documented. Um, but it could have implications for our natural, you know, components of trees. Based on our understanding, though, spotted lanternfly is best thought of as a plant stressor. So just to quickly review the life stages, it's important to know what it looks like in every life stage. They overwinter as eggs. So that's the only stage you'll find alive, you know, that's viable in the winter. And um, I'll show you more pictures of egg masses in a minute. Then here in Pennsylvania in about May, they start to hatch and they have a long hatch period. So we always get reports from points south where they're hatching, you know, in April and it has to do with how much heat has accumulated. Again, the USDA has like a predictor map that you can go and see based on temperature accumulation when eggs might be hatching. When they hatch, they're um, white with black spots. And in that nymphal stage, they all of the stages can jump really far, like superheroes. So sometimes people will confuse them with other insects, but if you poke at them and they jump really far, it could very well be a spotted lanternfly. They go through three molts in the black and white stage, and then the fourth instar has also this red coloration. Of course, they're getting bigger and bigger all the time, so they're going through this. And then um, here in Pennsylvania, about the end of July, they start becoming um, adults. The adults are present for a long time. So from the end of July here until the first killing frost, we have adults. The adults are the stage that are the most noticeable by the public. And that's often when we get reports that lead us to new you know, populations that um, get discovered. The picture E shows a spotted lanternfly where, they, where it is displaying its hind wings and you see the red coloration. But you usually don't see that. They usually look more like D, where they're sitting with their wings closed over their backs. If they get sprayed by an insecticide or injured, then they will display their wings. And they also display their hind wings sometimes when they're doing their mating dance, when you see them on the trees so or when they fly. But usually if they're just sitting feeding on a tree, they'll look more like D. So identifying the egg masses is really important because this is the life stage that I think has the greatest potential to be spread without somebody realizing they're moving it. Um, the females lay their eggs in rows and then she'll cover them with a secretion from her body. And when it first comes out of her body, it's white and wet, but then it quickly dries down to more of a tan or brown color. Sometimes she misses covering some of the eggs. That's not unusual. Sometimes you see an egg mass that's completely uncovered and we're not really sure why if they female got disturbed or, you know, why they do that. But here's an egg mass that was completely covered. And after it dries and it turns that grayish brown color, you often see these cracks start to form. So later on in the winter and early spring, the egg masses, the coverings are often very cracked. This is a picture of uh, egg masses on a rock where the rainwater has washed a lot of the covering away and you can see the eggs kind of through it. So Knowing what they look like is uh, part of the educational mis mission to teach people, you know, they can look different at different stages of the winter and, and so on. The other thing is that they will lay their eggs on almost anything. So this is the underside of a picnic bench. Uh, they will certainly lay their eggs on trees and they often look for sheltered areas. So kind of like the undersides of branches of trees, a place to look. This is a rock and there's five egg masses on the, under this rock. And here is a picture of egg masses on a tire. They'll lay their egg masses on uh, rubber, on rusty metal. There's some egg masses on the rusty metal. And that really illustrates the 
um, danger of not recognizing this. And if it's on a vehicle, taking that vehicle somewhere else and then having the eggs hatch and, and you could possibly spread them that way. So in high populations, they may lay a ridiculous amount of egg masses. This is a silver maple tree that was uh, badly pruned. And I don't know what it is about this tree, but the females loved this to lay eggs on one year. You can just see hundreds of egg masses here. Each egg mass will have about 40 eggs. So you can imagine how many do the math um, lanternflies this possibly could result in. So it's very important to know spotted lanternfly will not bite or sting people. I'm holding one on my hand here. Um, they do have those piercing sucking mouth parts, but they don't, they've never tried to, that I know of, you know, insert that into human skin. They don't sting, but I have gotten reports from the public where they got near a lot of spotted lanternflies, they got stung. And I believe that it probably was a yellow jacket, one of those stinging insects, um, rather than uh, the spotted lanternfly. We've, we've never had it documented that they bite or sting people. They are kind of um, like they're bold. They will land right on you. And, you know, that they're um, certainly challenging if somebody has an extreme fear of insects. They don't hurt structures. The picture shows them gathering on a sunny windowsill, and this is in the fall. And they have that behavior, but they're not trying to get into the structure. What they're doing is they are, they, they get to that warm side and they'll go up. And they get to the top and then they'll fly off of that structure and they're trying to go find other food sources. So they're not trying to get into your house and not going to hurt your house. We did have in Pennsylvania some unscrupulous pest management companies that came through the area and insisted that businesses needed to treat their buildings with pesticides to prevent the spotted lanternflies from damaging the, the buildings. And that has never happened. So if that occurs for you, you want to get the word out that you don't have to spray to have structures treated. So while this is all going on, we're getting sooty mold accumulation on the understory around trees. And that matters because it blocks the photosynthetic area and it can um, really weaken plants in the understory or even kill them. So that's just a picture of some of the trees that have been affected that way. Another reason sooty mold matters is that I've seen it totally obliterate road signs. So here I am going down a highway down kind of a steep hill uh, just on the south side of Reading. I'm following a truck. I get to this area. The truck is on its brakes. It's really not stopped. But you see that road sign? It says watch for stopped vehicles. And we have had like um, school bus um, park, you know, school bus stop signs obliterated by, by sooty mold and other signs. So that is a safety, a public safety concern. And this is a stretch of highway in Pennsylvania where nobody really ever cleans these signs and it wouldn't be safe to try. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about tree of heaven, you know, kind of interspersed here. And one of the questions that came up about tree of heaven in the early days, we saw how much spotted lanternfly liked them. And there was a, we wondered if they had to um, have a meal from Tree of Heaven in order to complete their life cycle. Was there some sort of requirement? So Dr. Kelly Hoover set up an experiment to test that. And here she has 10 cages, half of the, and there's a variety of plants in there, of trees in there. There was willow and silver maple, um, river birch, some other trees. We know that spotted lanternfly seems healthier if they can feed on, on several different types of trees and plants. So she had a smorgasbord in there for them. Half of the cages had tree of heaven and half of the cages didn't. And she wanted to see how um, they would develop. So her postdoc, Uyi, gathered all this data and, and it boiled down to this. So the, um, the cages with tree of heaven, Alanthus, the egg, the um, cumulative egg mass count is shown here. And um, we got up to 29 egg masses laid and they started laying the eggs in September, at the end of September. In the cages with no tree of heaven, they still laid some egg masses. There weren't as many, but um, 
and they laid them later. But these egg masses, we kept them for the next year and they were viable. They hatched. They were just as fit as the um, second generation from eggs that came from females that had been able to feed on tree of heaven. So that um, kind of put that question to rest. We knew that spotted lanternfly prefers tree of heaven, but does not require it. Spotted lanternfly move around in the landscape a lot. Um, in the spring, the nymphs are often found on things like roses, uh, brambles, uh, you know, uh, raspberries, things like that. Perennial plants, even annual plants, we've seen them on cucumber, basil, horseradish. Um, they seem to feed on a wide range, but often we see them on those kinds of plants in the spring. So the black and white nymphs, certainly on grape and tree of heaven year round. And then later on in the year, they'll, um, they move and they'll be on the black walnut, butternut, river birch. In the later part of the year, willow, staghorn, sumac, and then red and silver maple going into the fall. So this is unusual and it, it's this information will help you monitor landscapes, know which plants to look at as you, you know, go through the year. This chart is in our spotted lantern fly management guide. So another thing about them that we're trying to figure out what it means is that the sexes separate. Um, on September 6th of 2018, a colleague and I were gathering adults for a research experiment. We collected over 600 adult spotted lanternflies from Tree of Heaven in a public park. And this was for an efficacy study. We were going to see what kind of pesticides we could kill them with. Only two of these were male. You can tell if they're male um, by looking at the end of their abdomen. The females have a little red spot. The males don't. So um, you can tell that the sex is very easily in the adult stage. Is there some sort of reason or signal that's happening here? And could we somehow break it and keep them apart so they can't mate? That's, you know, just another thing that's sort of out there and another research experiment that, um, that needs to happen. So we've had spotted lanternflies since 2014. And we are seeing population fluctuations that remind us of other insects. So I'll relate this to the insect spongy moth, which was the formerly called the gypsy moth. These are numbers. For it. It's just a chart that shows some years. And, you know, they have information data that goes really far back. In 1970, there was a lot of spongy moth. And then, you know, late 70s, not so many. Another peak in the 80s. And, and so on. So this is documented about another insect that you see these population fluctuations. And we believe we're starting to see these kinds of fluctuations in Pennsylvania. And we believe it's related to um, natural factors that are stabilizing the populations. So we don't have these things defined yet, but we know host plant and availability can affect their um, you know, ability to reproduce and, and thrive. Um, natural enemies. We know there are uh, some natural enemies that can attack them, including a naturally occurring fungus or several naturally occurring fungi that were active and very effective in a wet year, one year in 2018. So weather conditions can affect them as well. And all of these things intersect. We don't really know how to predict populations based on any of these things, um, but we're aware this is happening. Of course, control measures taken factor into this. In your infestations, perhaps, um, you know, control measures are being enacted and that will affect the populations. And then if you, um, if you ever get a lot of insects in one place and the food source kind of runs out for them, they'll often move to another location. So we have these dynamics going on as well with spotted leonard fly. So what do you do about it? Well, we have spent a lot of time trying to um, figure out how to help people think through it. And this is from page eight in our management guide. So um, we came up with this chart to try to explain it to people. The first thing we ask is, well, how severe is it? How many are present? And is it, you know, just a low number? Now in Pennsylvania, if you have a low number, it's, you know, nothing to write home about. We, they've been here for a while. In Tennessee, if it's in an area where they haven't been discovered yet, 
even one lanternfly is, you know, is a, a problem. So, but in Pennsylvania, you could have a low amount or a tolerable amount, and then, you know, going up the chart to undesirable or like really intolerable, where you have um, these really uh, bad levels. Then we ask, what is the likelihood of impact? So do you have few of their favorite plants? Many? Are the plants under stress? Are you close to vulnerable plants like um, nurseries or vineyards? And, and, you know, to kind of take all of those factors into account. And then we're saying in this quadrant, it's less of a risk and we might recommend more cultural practices for management. This might be a very high risk where we would recommend potentially uh, an insecticide. So I'm getting into, um, you know, thinking about this in an integrated pest management framework. And we built the integrated pest management um, stair step here and it's, in page, it's on page nine of the management guide. And this is, this should seem similar to people who are, um, you know, some of our professionals that are used to looking at tree care options or plant care options. So we have cultural controls that are um, possible. Promote plant health, remove favored spotted lanternfly hosts. Don't assume all damages from spotted lanternfly. Physical and mechanical methods, scraping and smashing eggs, using tree traps, swatting, stomping nymphs and adults. Biological control, support natural enemies by providing habitat for them. Releasing predators, though, is currently not recommended. We don't have any evidence to say that that's um, going to help. If you decide to use uh, an insecticide, there's reduced toxicity insecticides like insecticidal soap, or horticultural oil, neem, botanical oils, and pyrethrum <clears throat> that we have found to be um, effective. And then, of course, there are traditional chemical control options as well. So you work your way up the, the stair step. So let's think about some of these things. Um, eliminating tree of heaven. If you know where there's a lot of tree of heaven, you might want to get rid of as you know most of them. Maybe keep one for a sentinel tree or as a trap tree. I'm going to talk about that last, I think, in this presentation. If you want to eliminate tree of heaven, it's best to use an herbicide. If you just cut them down, they'll sprout back from the trunk and from the roots, and it just can make the problem worse. So will you reduce uh, spotted lanternfly populations? We're not really sure. Will it just increase feeding pressure on other host plants? If you have a grove of tree of heaven next to a vineyard and you cut all the tree of heaven down and all those lanternflies move into the grapes? We're not really sure. And then think about, can you use it as a trap? I'm gonna show that here in a minute. So that's a cultural option. The next thing would be mechanical, destroying spotted lanternfly eggs. So you can scrape them off of wherever they're laid into a bag with some rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer in there. And, you know, you keep them in there so they, um, you know, and throw that in the trash. So that is one way to destroy a lot of spotted lanternflies. Um, I should say you can just smash them as well. And when you pop them, you can kind of see there, there's one that's popping and like the, the liquid's coming out. It's kind of satisfying, kind of fun, like mini bubble wrap. You can catch nymphs with the traps. The nymphs are feeding on the succulent parts of the, the leaves and the canopy of trees, and they often fall out of the trees. And then they'll walk to a stem or a trunk and they'll go back up. They're trying to get to where they can insert their mouth parts and feed. So in the beginning, we were using flypaper kinds of sticky bands, and you could you can catch thousands of lanternfly nymphs in a heavily infested area. But they also catch other creatures. So we don't want to uh, hurt any other birds or, you know, any other insects or larger mammals. And, um, and you need to protect those. If you're using sticky bands, this is a window screening that's just attached to the top. And then you leave the bottom of that open like an apron. That'll keep the birds off the sticky band, but the lanternfly nymphs can go up. That's one way to do it, but it's really not the best way. The best way to have a trap that is much more safe for wildlife is to use a circle trap. And this is, again, it's kind of like a funnel shaped structure 
the spotted lanternflies will climb up into there and go into the bag where they can't get out and they will die. Now, in this case, you know, I don't have this one going all the way around the tree, but I'm still catching a lot of lanternfly nymphs. If you wanted to put you know, on a big tree, one on either side, or you can make these. We have a fact sheet on our website that kind of gives you a recipe, like takes you through pictures of how we build them and you can build them very inexpensively. And then you can make them any size you want them. Um, you can also buy them online if you want someone else to make it and just uh, do it that way. Here's our build your own circle trap fact sheet. I was doing this uh, during COVID and I'm at home <laughs> trying to figure out what I have around the house that I can build a trap out of. And uh, milk jug lids worked, but uh, or tops worked, but other things can work too. All right, we mentioned biological control. Pictures of other insects and arachnids that will eat them. So spiders, wheel bugs, praying mantids. There are some tiny uh, parasitic wasps. These are really parasitoids where they lay eggs inside the body of the lanternfly or the eggs of the lanternfly and will kill it. There are, um, there's a few different ones of these. There's one that was introduced years ago to combat spongy moth. And we have found that affecting spotted lanternfly eggs, but not at any levels that are, you know, really impacting the population. There are researchers with the USDA that are looking at this as well. And they've brought one in particular, tiny parasitoid wasp that will attack the nymphs of spotted lanternfly but it's in quarantine. So you can't just release things like that into another continent. And there are some really amazing researchers trying to figure out if that can ever be released and used as a biological control. And then um, we also know that some fungi will affect them. These are two pictures of two naturally, well, really three naturally occurring fungi that we found attacking spotted lanternfly. This is Bavaria bassiana, which is also available as a formulated pesticide product. So you can, in Pennsylvania, buy products that are listed, uh, Bavaria bassiana products that are listed for ornamental use on ornamental trees. So it's illegal in Pennsylvania, but we have done pretty extensive experiments trying to use that technology on a wide scale. And we've had mixed results so we don't really know why, if it's uh, weather dependent or if it has more to do with the life stage of the insects that they're in, but we can't recommend it because we haven't had consistent efficacy results. The uh, pictures here are all uh, samples that were found out in nature. So this was naturally occurring in a wet year and it's great. I mean, it kills the lanternfly and the fungus grows out of its you know, body joints and its eyes. It's really... Um, pretty aggressive fungus and cool to see that. This is a different one that has a more uh, filamentous kind of mycelium, the fungal body. And this was a fusarium that was attacking um, spotted lanternfly eggs. And then those eggs didn't hatch. So um, they exist, but we don't really have a way that we can use them reliably yet either. So who else is helping? There was a Penn State study examining nat native predator potential, including birds. So this is a great picture of an owl eating one. And this was a study where um, one of our grad students set up a Facebook page and it, like a citizen science project where people would report to her what kinds of other creatures they saw eating spotted lanternflies. It was called Birds Biting Bad Bugs. And um, she came up with this, which shows... Um, you know, the makeup of who, you know, which creatures were helping with. So um, she had arthropods and birds and some other things on here. And that is a published paper at this point, so you can find it. Um, in the bird section, chicken and cardinal were the, the most likely, most often observed predators. So what about pesticides? Well, of course, read the label first and follow your state pesticide laws. You wanna check what kind of equipment you have. If you have a backpack sprayer, you're probably not going to be very good at spraying a big tall tree. And then that also um, increases your risk of drift and, and other things. So um, check if you have equipment that will work. For most residential um, situations, I would first try things like botanical oils. There are registered botanical oil products that are 
um, known to be effective. I would try insectocidal soap, horticultural spray oil, neem oil, and spinosad. Now, all of these things, these active ingredients, there are formulations that are considered okay for organic food production. So these are the lowest toxicity types of products. Um, pyrethrins, uh, that is a derivative of a chrysanthemum flower, another one of these very low toxicity products. And some pyrethroids, which are synthetically manufactured like um, analogs of pyrethrin, and they can have the longest residual. So for contact sprays, I'd start at the top of this list and work my way down. I want to say that in Pennsylvania, we had a lot of people that um, used, you know, reactively poor pesticide practices, and they were rummaging around in their kitchen, under the sink, in the medicine cabinet, in the garage, and spraying trees and plants with things that were not licensed insecticides, not safe for use on the plants, not safe for the applicator. I had people spraying trees with kerosene, and I had people using blow torches, and I hope they weren't next door neighbors. Um, you know, we had all sorts of that going on. And I'm hoping that all of you will get the message out. Only use registered pesticides that have directions and then read the label and use them safely. So traditional insecticides like carbaryl or malathion also work well against this insect. Um, hopefully you don't need to resort to those. You can use the lower toxicity products. And then we have systemic products that you can treat the trees with and um, make the whole tree toxic to spotted lanternfly. So dinotefiran is the one that's working the most reliably. It is the most water soluble in this class, but um, it is a neonicotinoid. So there are some issues you know, on the state level with registrations for those products. And of course you would only, according to the label, treat trees with that after the flowers have faded. We wanna protect our pollinators from any residue that might find their way into flowers. Imidacloprid is another systemic that has worked in some cases, especially as injectables, but as, trunk, as um, soil drenches or, um, well, mostly as soil drenches, they're, they're uh, just kind of unreliable. We, they're less water soluble. It's harder to get them into the tree in the right concentration at the right time to be effective. So um, that's pretty much the list of, of insecticides. I told you I'd tell you about using Tree of Heaven as a trap tree. And in this case, if you have a group of um, Tree of Heaven, you'd kill the majority of those trees and try to keep maybe 10% of those trees. Hopefully you can keep just the male trees. Tree of Heaven has male trees and female trees. The female trees make a ton of seed and those seeds spread that and it's you know, it's an invasive in its own right. So kill the female trees so we don't have seed. Keep a few of the male trees around and then treat those male trees with a systemic insecticide. Um, most times we're using dinotefuran products for this. And then if that's one of those trees that they really love to feed on, when they come looking for food, they'll feed on it and you can kill thousands and thousands of spotted lanternfly with one treated uh, tree of heaven as a trap tree. This shows a picture of just uh, 24 hours after treating one. Um, you know, it can it can work really fast. So the bottom line is kill them if you can, but use recommended practices. Don't move them around and report it so our agencies know where they are and people can react to it. Okay, so I can take questions. All right. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I have several questions for you. Um, the first one, what should homeowners in suburbia be on the lookout for if they don't have fruit trees in the yard? Yeah, I think uh, just watch the plants. Um, look for the nymphs in the spring. Check your perennials. If you have brambles or roses, they're often found first by in residential settings on those plants. Um, if you wanted to put a circle trap on a tree, if you have, you know, like a maple or a birch tree, put a circle trap up and see if you're catching any of the nymphs. 
And then if they are in your area and in the adult stage, that's the easiest time to see them. But I think monitor, 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 and and check the Penn State Management Guide to help you know which plants to be watching at certain times of the year. All right, uh, the next question, how can we get local governments and private landowners to help eradicate the host plant Tree of Heaven? Many don't even realize it is running rampant in their woods. Yeah, um, so certainly through education, if you have um, you know, township advisory boards, we have advisory action committees here in Pennsylvania, shade tree commissions, um, education through personal communication or through those kinds of entities. And then um, a lot of, in Pennsylvania, our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and, our, and some of the USDA people are trying to prioritize areas that might have a lot of tree of heaven that are um, close to transportation corridors or vineyards. So, you know, our, our public agencies have just so much in, as far as resources go. So they have to have some sort of prioritization um, mechanization. If the the public um, municipality or you know HOA or whatever also has some resources, we try to work together to do the right thing with the resources that we have. Oh. The photos you showed earlier, someone asked, are those photos a good representation of what an infestation could look like, or could there be substantially less spotted lantern uh, flies present, making them harder to see? Um, I, I think in years when the populations are high, which are often the first years of the infestation, those are representative of what we saw. So in subsequent years where we had like dips in the population, they were harder to find, but we've had, we've had kind of a cycle where we've had high years and lower years. So it's new for you. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if you see population levels like that, you know, in the next few years. I know they had them this year in Pittsburgh like that. And, you know, in the urban part of Pittsburgh, and it was just high populations and people were not, not so happy about it. <laughs> um, what are some key spotted lanternfly messages our tree board can use to educate our citizens in our small town? Yeah, I think I learn to identify it and also understand why we're concerned about it. So talk about protecting agriculture and grapes and, and the health, the potential health impacts on trees. Um, so learn to identify it, understand why it's a problem and that don't move it around message is really important. You don't wanna hurt um, your commerce. So we don't want people to avoid buying products from Pennsylvania for fear of lanternfly. We want people who buy things from us to, to rest assured that we have, we've inspected the items and we know what to look for and we're not going to send this to you. So if you're moving, you know, even household items, if you're moving vehicles or campers, um, you know, it's not just businesses that can spread it. It can be just, you know, average people. Um, it seems a spotter. It seems a spotted lanternfly response in Tennessee. It needs a coordinated statewide and regional approach. What are some of the groups that should be part of that team effort? Yeah, um, I, I I think I would direct that question to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture first and the university, and that's how we've um, you know how it came to be in Pennsylvania. So Penn State University, but we have other universities that have been also helping a lot um, with research and discovery, Kutztown University, Temple University, um, and then our Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. We have uh, regular meetings where we get together and the USDA people in a lot of cases will come to that as well. So, you know, it's a, it's a puzzle to fit together. You have to find funding to get the educational message out. You have to find funding to get more research done.
but um, you're welcome to share anything we have. So if you like our spotted lanternfly management guide, I can put you in touch with um, Amy Duke is our person that would share that digital file with you and you could put University of Tennessee on it and print it and hand it out to people. We have enlisted our volunteer groups. So shade tree um, groups for sure, but also our master gardeners and our master watershed stores through, through Penn State Extension. Um, Boy Scout groups. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of different volunteer groups that have put on events and, um, you know, hosted educational days for people and sessions. Um, and we still have a few more questions. Are you good to stay on I am. longer? Mm -hmm. And for anyone who needs to log off, if you do need to log off, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. But the next question, have bats been identified as a possible predator? I haven't, um, I haven't really encountered that. And I think one of the reasons is that, that spotted lanternfly adults, when they fly around, they're flying during the day and the bats are out at night. So I think it's just, you know, different times of the day. And we don't really have very, I, I can't think of one account of a bat that was, you know, captured eating one, like photographed eating one. Um, I wouldn't say it couldn't happen, but um, it's not thought that it would be a big help in a control setting. Have systemics shown to cause more pressure on host plants? Um, I'm not sure what that question is asking. I'm just kind of reading insecticides. Um, I guess have they caused more pressure on what's this other host? Maybe plant? that person could could reframe their question. I'll and and put like put more into the chat so I have more to go on. Okay. As I say, we'll see, I'll come back to that one. I think West Pal, if you're still on, that was your question. Um, the next question, what happens to males and females after mating and laying eggs? Yeah, so, um, they will mate and the females will lay probably two egg masses. And there is speculation that points south of Pennsylvania, they may be able to achieve three. So the females in Pennsylvania, they will continue to lay their eggs until the killing frost kills them. They do get slower. Like you can tell as they get older, they're less and less fit. And um, and we get killing temperatures most years in November that kills them. So we have not seen them survive as adults going into the winter, but they do have a long egg laying period. Okay, and Wes just put a rewording of that question into the chat. Okay. Would treating a tree of heaven potentially cause the insect to avoid that host and move on oh. to grapes, maple, willow, etc.? Yeah, I thank you. I, I understand now. Um, we have not seen that. So the, the trees that have been treated with di dinotefuran is pretty much what they're using for trap trees. The um, the spotted lanternfly don't seem to avoid that tree, no. And if you have the opportunity, you know, say you have, you're in an area where there's pretty many spotted lanternfly this year, and you find a tree of heaven that is one of those favorite trees that they just love, keep that one as the trap tree, especially if it's a male and won't produce seed. And then treat that one with dinotefuran. And they tend to come back to those trees year after year until the health of the tree is so poor that they abandon it because it's no longer a good food source. Um, how far do they travel on their own without a transporter? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and there's been different research projects for that. Um, you know, real controlled studies where somebody launched them into a wind tunnel and how far could they go at certain wind speeds. Um, but I think they also, I've seen them catch like the, uh, what do you call it? The drafts, the currents of the rising heat, and they can go pretty far on their own flight. But when they're um, 
you know, added to the the heat currents and and like a strong wind, they can go pretty far. So somebody was watching them um, on Hawk Mountain, which is on the Blue Ridge Mountain, which is the very southern Appalachians in southeastern Pennsylvania. And they were flying, you know, really high up in the air and going down into the valley below. So um, I would say miles. They could go, you know, couple a mile, two miles, three miles on their own, depending what kind of wind currents they catch. But the egg masses can go hundreds of miles mm-hmm. in a vehicle, right? Yeah. Um, this person says they've read that they also feed on hops. Have you seen any evidence of that? We have seen evidence of them feeding on hops. Um, they seem to like that plant and they um, are a concern for the quality of the hops because of the honeydew and the sooty mold. So the hops, you know, at, we haven't measured how they're affecting the health of the hops with any metrics. The plants don't look good, but part of that is because they're covered in sooty mold. So they are definitely a concern for hops. Um, one person asked about Amy Duke's contact information. Mm. Okay. Um, if you just Google Amy Duke Penn State, you'll find her. She's Penn State College of Ag Sciences Communications. And if you ask her to share any of our um, educational information, she'll send you the file. Um, do females return to the same tree to lay eggs year after year? They do. Uh, they they seem to really like those protected sites and there's something that they sense and you'll often find, you know, an old egg mass from the previous year and then a new egg mass like right next to it or even on top of it. Not always, but you, you'll often see that. They, they do tend to lay eggs in the same kind of spots and I don't know how they know. Um, and then someone also asked, well, they asked if this would be recorded and we are recording it and it will be posted on YouTube. But um, those are all the questions I have. So I'll, I guess if anyone else has a question, they could put it in the chat, but that's all I have. Okay, thanks, Katie and, and Emily. Thanks for taking time to answer those questions and for your presentation. It was a combination of somber reality about the spotted lanternfly, and we needed to know that, but also you've given us some hope and some positive steps we can take here in Tennessee and beyond. And I, I've learned a lot, and I know our audience has too um, from your presentation. Uh, I do want to add, uh, you had, I took a, a minute to look at your link to your spotted lanternfly uh, webpage at Penn State. Mm-hmm. It's excellent. And I wonder if you could uh, show that again for those that might want to hit that link or if we can put it in our chat room, Katie, but I highly recommend that. It's so easy to use and well-designed, but for those that want to dig deeper into this threat and what they can do, uh, I highly recommend visiting your website. Well, thank you. Um, It's really easy to find if you just Google spotted lanternfly Penn State, it'll come up. Mm -hmm. Um, I... I have, I'm not sure that I can put it in the chat pod because I have like dual screen up. <laughs> um, maybe okay, no. Maybe, uh, maybe if I do this. Okay. I think uh, just if people Google Penn State and Spotted Lantern Fly, they'll find yeah. it. Yeah. I think I found it. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat. Is it extension.psu.edu slash Spotted Lantern Fly? Yep, that's it. All right, I just put that in the chat for everyone. Thank you. Right. Yeah, now, How about now that, Katie? Been... Yeah, right. Just leave it to you, Katie. Well, anyway, thank you so much, Emily and uh, Will. Okay. Uh, in our, uh, do you have another final thought? Um, just consider us a resource and reach out to us. You know, it's me, uh, Brian Walsh, Amy Corman. I have, you know, but any of our extension people can help you find resources. I'm very interested to see what happens in Tennessee. Um, now I want to go there this summer and go look for spotted lanternfly. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'll get there, but um, but I'm I'm interested just to find out how how y'all make out with it. And um, we did have one of our national county agents meetings there a couple of years ago in Chattanooga, 
I got to go on some great tours of the nursery production area in your state. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested to see what happens and consider us a resource. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, all right. Well, with that, we'll end our webinar. I want to thank uh, everyone for attending. Uh, we had a good turnout and many of you stayed on and uh, I think the time was well spent. So you'll have a good rest of the day and week. And Emily, we hope to see you when you visit Tennessee. Let us know when you're coming. I'll have to come look you up. <laughs> okay.